All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, in Nigeria, 40.1% of people are poor, according to 2018-2019 National Monetary Poverty Line, and 63% are multidimensionally poor, according to the National MPI 2022. Thank God for the statistics. When people are poor, they are more likely to experience hunger, or nutrition, disease, illiteracy, and lack of access to basic necessities. And this can lead to social unrest and undermine economic growth. This is why poverty alleviation in Nigeria is important because it can uh, help to improve the lives of millions of people, boost economic growth, and create a more stable and prosperous society. By lifting people out of poverty, Nigeria can create a better future for all. So last week we got reports that the federal government recently disbursed about 2 billion out of 5 billion Naira um, palliative package for each state of the federal uh, federation and the federal capital territory to address the impact of removal of, subs uh, of um, subsidy. Now this has posed an important question on the strategies being implemented by the government to cushion the effect of the fuel subsidy removal as well as alleviate poverty in the land. So today we are asking, um, referencing the palliative distribution, what are the sustainable strategies to alleviate poverty in Nigeria? Now please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation, send us an SMS or WhatsApp as we want, Um Let me hear your thoughts of one minute and I'll bring in the camera seat. What do you think? First of all, do you agree with the palliative structure that has been put or do you think no. it can be done better? I, I, no, it can definitely be done better and it's just a short-term um, solution. If, even if we were to call it a solution, I mean, if you, you need to understand the root causes of um, poverty. And if Nigeria is saying that they are a serious partner to the UN on SDG goals, that's zero hunger. I, I don't think we're doing too good a job. Mm -hmm. I think we can do better, but it, it, we have to go to the drawing table and actually look at um, solutions that would work, financial literacy, education. I mean, there will be so much. It's, it has to be beyond palliatives. How are you, Sanzi? Um, definitely. I still uh, stand in the opinion, on the opinion that uh, uh, poverty is weaponized, mm -hmm. you know, and that, is, that, is, that only explains why you would get a, a pack of noodles and have rice and stuff and give it to people and believe that you're doing them well. Mm -hmm. These are things that they are entitled. You don't even have to do it. Put structures in place and people can provide that. 63% of Nigerians multidimensionally poor, that is an alarming rate. And for a country that has so much resources, I don't think there's any palliative they would give or announce, even if they reach two million people in one hour. I cannot clap for them because it's what we're entitled to. Mm. I'm not impressed. Mm. Mm. So Ikeme Sitef Young is a legal practitioner, geopolitical analyst, research consultant, and communications professional and public affairs commentator. He's currently head of research at SBM Intelligence, an Africa-focused risk consultancy, and Nigeria's foremost geopolitical intelligence firm based in Lagos, where he manages a diverse research team that spans all Nigeria's 36 states, as well as Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, and South Africa. He has, um, he's had a long career in political blogging, has acted as an outside consultant to four Nigerian governorship races, has managed um, regulatory and compliance affairs as well as strategic communications for a number of Nigerians and international multinationals. Yes, we got the right candidate for this conversation. <laughs> because, thank you so much. Wait, wait you can see, this is your first time here. This is my first time in the studio. <laughs> Uh, like literally, we've had the chemistry since we started ways in 2019, but wow. this is literally his first time <laughs> yeah. in studio. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. We're honored to have you. But Ikeme Sitte, we've been waiting for you on this conversation. And I, I specifically told um, Omola that I needed someone that understood because, again, somehow we know your work. We know how far you've gone, you know, at your company to do a lot of groundwork, a lot of research. So. I don't just want us to talk like because again sometimes when you have conversations like this, it seems like you are you are you are attacking a system. I don't want us to, to sound like we're attacking anybody. These are data, this is figures, this is numbers that they've given to us, right? And every time I hear a government announce that they want to give palliatives, it just rubs me off wrongly. Like literally I cringe. Like, do you guys understand that this thing is beyond rice and beans? Do you understand? Like there is poverty and if for, 
for anything if we've never ever thought about poverty like people have been saying it that poverty is weaponized in this country if you've never thought about it before the events that have happened between the weekend or the death of whatever till this afternoon where there was a huge court clash it tells you that you know there's a huge role that poverty plays in some of these things because you can only um what's it called recruit people that you know they feel like there's really nothing for me mm -hmm. do you understand and one of those things that makes them feel that way is if they are poor mm -hmm. you know so just help me understand right well, first of all you looking through the structure of what the government has said about palliatives what are your thoughts and you know how do you think um we can even come out of maybe raise our heads out of the water you've you've asked a lot of first off it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be here finally i know i've been a i've been a zoom supporter <laughs> for uh, for three years plus so but but it's good to be in studio um ah, poverty i don't even know where to start to be honest the thing with the palliatives um process that first let's understand it's a stopgap and even as stop gaps go this is probably not the best that we could have done we spent almost 10 times more right to manage covid for example and we didn't do a good enough job right uh, managing the covid pandemic then the primary challenge though that i have with this particular scheme is that um as a researcher as someone who deals with data and especially as someone who goes out into the field and i have colleagues who go out into the field right when we think about structuring a study or a scheme or any kind of field research we think about what our target respondent is right mm -hmm. who are they where do they live what do they do right how are we going to um, most effectively and efficiently reach them right and this is just us as a company just doing our own thing right on behalf of clients um it's not clear to me from all of the communications from all of the government surrogates around the palliative scheme that they particularly know who these things are addressed at they don't know their keywords right mm -hmm. yeah so 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 how how do you design something that is supposed to address a clear and present need right that research has showed us a plurality depending on the data you look at a majority of nigerians right are sealed by if you don't know who they are where they are and how you're going to reach out to them no one has given us those numbers the national um social Insur insurance register which was only really built up right um in the light of the covid19 pandemic last i checked was about 1.6 1.7 million nigerian yeah. households which yeah. sounds like a lot but when you think about how many numbers, nigerian households yeah. are out there right is 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 really a drop in the bucket and that register was specifically skewed towards certain states in certain parts of the country yes the states that have the most need but then there's need everywhere and that's the thing about poverty in nigeria is that's why researchers talk about multi-dimensional poverty which is that this is not just a situation of i don't have money in my pocket is that I don't have money in my pocket and I most likely don't have a job and I'm most likely I'm related to people mm. that are in the same situation with me. And so the prospects of me actually breaking out of what's called the poverty trap is really, yes. really hard. Mm. Right. Yeah. So it's not clear that the government has done that level of thinking. First, the announcement was a bit rushed. It happened very early in the life cycle of the administration. It's not clear that there were policy planners or they consulted with, you know, Mm. policy thinkers right in this space we're designing that scheme mm. secondly the amounts we're talking at are talking about are very small it's not clear how long right the palliative scheme is going to last it's not clear how many people will be targeted by this even the distribution mechanisms the federal government made comments about them channeling channeling those resources through the state governments but very very few state governments have actually come out to say what they are going to do we are seeing again like you said we're seeing the indomie and the half tuba of yam and the beans. you know the beans and the how many cups of rice right and so it just feels like more of the same and i think from a lot of what we're hearing and we do a fair amount of you know social issues research um Nigerians are actually more frustrated with a, a slightly bad idea executed poorly than you not doing anything at all. Mm. Because with the latter, at the very least, people would know, okay, 
you don't know what you're doing yeah. or you didn't do anything with the other you're demonstrating you have the capacity to address this issue but you're not but addressing you're not, yeah. it effectively yeah, yeah. right which is even more of you know an, an insult right to to many of these people and that's at the heart of all of the frustration all of the strife all of the people living in the country and all of the insecurity really that you're seeing mm -hmm. in, in the country the way i always put it is People who own businesses and own houses don't go on strike. They don't riot. They don't, you know, they are not socially maligned, right? It's people, like you said, who don't have a stake in the system who are perfectly fine with destroying what other people yes. have because at the very least, they are bringing you down to where they yeah. are, so is the thinking. Crabs in a bucket. Precisely. You no, know well, let's take a break, right? When we come back from that break, I know Diola and Sanzi have a question. Stay with us, we'll be right back. All right, thanks for staying with us now. If you just tuned in, we're discussing sustainable strategies to alleviate poverty in Nigeria. And we have with us a message if you're not. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to read one eight zero three eight four six six three. Do you like your Okay, so my question to you is, um, how can Nigerian, I mean, we know the problem. So how can Nigeria leverage, I mean, the vast resources we have in order to, you know, further uh, a more robust... Um, economic solution you know because i i actually feel that um if we look at it from an economic perspective you know we're more likely to begin to see some way forward to say oh okay maybe if we put this kind of structure in place then we can you know it, it, it can work directly with um solving poverty issues but not um how would i say it um Okay, let, let me stop at that. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, I think I got the gist of the yeah. question. I think the first thing is to have a very good plan. And I know mm. people get frustrated because here in Nigeria, we're very good at writing policy documents, yeah. we're very good at making those announcements mm. and all of those things. Okay. But one of the fundamental challenges that all of those plans and efforts have had is that they've not had a lot of multi-stakeholder imputes. Mm. So are you talking to people at the forefront of addressing poverty? Are you mm. talking to business owners, people that you expect to employ people, which is in the end the most sustainable funnel to not only get people out of poverty, but actually keep them out of poverty. Mm. If none of us have jobs, none of us will have an income, none of us will have resources, all of us will be in the mud, mm. right? Yeah. So actually having a good plan that accounts for all of the perspectives of every side of this conversation, right? It's mm. critical and, and it's important. This is state government, local government level, civil society, religious, cultural institutions, whatever it is, right? I try to talk to people and figure out what is the core of the problem. Poverty might be pervasive in Nigeria, but poverty manifests itself differently, Yeah. right? Right across the country, right? So the average poor person in Lagos, in many other parts of the country, might be close to lower middle income. Right, for example, so whatever approach you're going to take to solving the poverty the situation in Lagos, in Lagos will be different, will be be different, different. from what you're doing in mm -hmm. Akwaibom yeah. or Adama or, in or, the in, north, yeah. or in the north, right? And especially in the north, mm -hmm. I would argue, right? So that's the first that's the first part. The second part is what are the advantages that Nigeria has? You know, mm. lots of people talk about you know our vast human resources. Well, what does that mean? People mm. talk about our vast natural resources, what does that mean? For me personally, and this is something that we've thought about a fair amount at SBM, Nigeria has some very big advantages. One is the cost of labor here in Nigeria is very, very low. Very low. So it's very easy for you to enter into various sectors as well as the beginning stages, which is how every com country that's ever developed right, in the world really started. Mm. The second is we're predominantly English speaking. The third is our geographic location. We're in the same time zone with Europe. We're not that far behind North America. We're not that far, you know, we're not that far ahead rather of North America. We're not mm. that far behind right, Asia and the Middle East. So we can be like a Philippines. We can be like an India. We can be an outsourcing capital of the world. The vast majority of Nigerians, more than 60% of Nigerians are younger than the four of us mm -hmm. who are sat here. Mm -hmm. And none of us are really that old. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> that's my own. I can only speak for myself. Oh, let's <laughs> you know, precisely. Yeah. Yes, no. yeah. So, 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 so think about that. The right? resource. The resources. So if you pair that, for example, mm. with a, a massive and a proper infrastructural development plan, it means immediately right, you can employ tens of millions of Nigerians to build roads, build rail, 
build schools, build all of these things out there. Right now, there are many Nigerians who are in a position where they can't afford to be choosers. I don't know if you guys have had kind of the same experience I've had where someone reaches out to you and they're like, oh, I'm looking for work. And I'm like, okay, what kind of work do you want? They're anything. Like, anything. <laughs> right? anything. I'm telling you, right? So, so, so we are at that point. And these are people who for the most part, right, in our circles, have some education and all of yeah. that stuff. University. With a lot of Nigerians that are not in that position, they can pretty much do anything. So with a well-designed skills acquisition scheme, mm -hmm. paired to, particularly for me, infrastructure and agriculture, but I don't think about agriculture the way our politicians do. The way our politicians think of agriculture is give a tractor here, mm -hmm. give fertilizer here, mm -hmm. give, give seedlings here, and then we oh, go... For example, one big gap we have in agriculture is the absolute lack of agricultural extension workers. Yeah. So people that will continually coach and teach farmers, mm. okay, this is how your harvest performed last mm. year. Mm. If you tweak year and year, if you use the right mix of fertilizing, weeding, crop and pest control and all of that, this is what you can mm. do. And this is something that Nigeria used to be really good at. The International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan is situated there for a reason, mm. right? It's a world leader in agricultural research. So we have assets already on hand, right, that we can leverage. You just need someone who is thinking broadly in a way that makes sense, in a way that is systemic. And it, it, it's crazy. And in the end, why lots of people, including you, believe that poverty is weaponized is because you know, if you're, if you're able to hand people crumbs and people yeah. see you as the crumbs handler, they would become dependent on oh, you. Yeah, thank you. And that gives you a hold and a power over and them. That's not sustainable. And it's not sustainable in the long term because those people, um, our very good friend Chetan Wanze likes to say, there was a particular project that we did in 2018 or 2019 in Natural Our State, right? And so, um, Chetan and a colleague of ours went, went, went in a village not far from Lafia, and he met someone who was his exact age, born the same year, born the same month, born almost to the same week, right? And he had three children, two wives, and the two wives were pregnant at the time. Mm -hmm. And that person was a police officer, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, so the question then becomes, what is the plan for Nigeria for that f five, six you know, family, household. And the point is, when you replicate that right across the country, the average fertility of the average Nigerian is 4.6, 4.7 children. So the average Nigerian woman will give birth to four plus children in their lifetime. Mm. So in essence, our population is set to double mm. in 25 years. Mm. If we have a problem with providing for Nigerians now, now. think of the Nigerians that are on their way. Mm. Right. So it's a really, really big problem, as, as it were. And I think, in the end, the one bit of optimism that I have is that it's just clearly unsustainable. So at some point, the entire apocat will break. Right. Mm. And something will have to be done. The challenge is, oftentimes, you can have change in a systemic and orderly way, mm. or you can have it violently yeah. and with chaos. Mm. Right. If you wait... And that is where the thing is scary. But I want Sanzi to come in because... Yeah. When I saw that uh, police person saying that all the young people, he did not say some, mm -hmm. he didn't say most. Mm -hmm. He said all the young people in Shagamu are all cultists. <laughs> I said, okay, we're well, just waiting. Because like you said, if these people do not take time to find a way to build a sustainable structure that alleviates this poverty, these kinds of violence would it would it will yeah. it the, the change will come but it will come violently. Yeah. Sans, let me come to you. Yeah, uh, so um interesting conversation so far. I enjoy listening to you. Yeah. Um you talked about skill acquisition as one of you know the more realistic ways of uh, poverty alleviation. Now I'm looking at the other side of it as someone who constantly walks the line between the super poor and the super wealthy, right? So I have been in situations where maybe the government works into some village and says, okay, here are 50 people, skill acquisition, I'm teaching you to sow, I'm teaching you to do this, I'm teaching you to farm and all whatnot. And you're done learning the skills, but then it's either you don't have the equipment to do that and you don't have the funds to handle that, or they give you the equipment, like maybe they give you a baker or they give you a sewing machine and you find out that you don't have the electricity. So at the end of the day, you have all those things packed in your house. 
but you don't have the electricity or you, you can't afford to buy the gas. So you, you, are, you are talking about the news that the uh, price of uh, cooking gas is about to skyrocket to 18000 for 12.5. You know, so for this skill acquisition, how, how realistic is it as a more, uh, as a better option, according to what you said? Yeah, I mean, it's realistic if you think about it in, in a holistic and in an intelligent manner. The, mm -hmm. the challenge is we've done skip skill acquisition schemes in mm -hmm. silos. Yes. Mm -hmm. we've, we've just done it wrongly, right? So think about what are the advantages that we have? Right. What kind of country do you do you want to to build as as a policymaker? Mm -hmm. Right. And then offer incentives. The, the main thing that government does is to is to offer incentives and create the right environment for for people to actually go and solve the problems. Mm. Right. Um, the the challenge with governance in Nigeria is that oftentimes the government either doesn't want to do a thing, or if it decides to do a thing, it decides to do a thing by itself. Mm. Right. And it leaves no collaborations. On the, it leaves entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and all of that in the middle. I was reading, I was reading a newsletter this morning, for example, and the the company that was the initial private sector partner for the national identity scheme said they lost a hundred million dollars mm -hmm. working with government, so they don't want to work with government again, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know, so that just underscores the collaboration gap, mm -hmm. right, that exists on the governance side of things. So the the right thing I think is to create the right incentives. For example. As my intelligence right now, we are advising a coalition of civil society organizations that are trying to figure out how to make non-profit sector regulation work in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And one of the chief complaints they have is that, you know, government is all good and great and they talk a good game, but after all the meetings and after the seminars and yeah. all of that stuff, they go behind the scenes and they write these really, really interesting regulations mm -hmm. that really only exist to protect their interests, mm -hmm. not to unlock the abilities of people to get things done, mm. right? So that's where, that's where sort of the, the mismatch is, right? So what's my very, 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 very rough draft of a policy prescription around this would be is to think about what are the things that we want Nigerian youths to be globally competitive in? Right. Thank you. How do we pair that to the needs that we currently have? We have to feed people, we have to house people, we have to clothe people, mm -hmm. we have to give them jobs. Mm -hmm. And then begin to mm -hmm. write up a policy that basically either gives people tax incentives if they invest yeah. in A, B, C, D, E, F, G priority areas mm -hmm. and then list the priorities, right? So that it encourages people that have money and are sitting on money yeah. to go out there and Thank get you. things done. Mm -hmm. You know, it can mess it. A young, a friend of mine actually went to New York fashion school. And by the time she came back, she actually, I think at some point she wanted to even approach the government, her state government. Because you see, with a shout, say, made in Abba, made in Abba. How many of us are wearing anything Abba here? Do you understand? I <laughs> am. My, pants. my shoes <laughs> are. <laughs> but guess what? So we, this is where I'm coming oh, with. Our exceptions. Yes. This is where I'm coming with. <laughs> Abba has the, the capacity billion, mm -hmm. to become a, bill, a, a trillion dollar or even if it's a gazillion dollar comp, um, industry. industry. Yeah. Why? Because they've been able to, even with the limited resources, mm -hmm. right? They've been able to replicate things that you will not believe that it is coming from that place. Do you understand what I'm saying? So she saw what they did in New York, for instance. Like in New York, there are people that their specialty is just to fix this button yeah. on this shirt. That's the only thing they do. So it is a massive warehouse, like it's extremely expanse of land, all with um, machines. Some people is just to sew the zip on the dress. Some people is just to put the button. Everybody has, but you see that value chain. By the time they churn out all those apparel, it goes to the stores, in common. Do you understand? So she was saying that why can't we replicate this thing in Nigeria? Because we already have the market in Africa. Like literally, these guys are doing exceptionally well without even these mainstream machineries. Now imagine if you equip them with those machineries. We are not only getting, so you, we are now cutting off ex, 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 importing clothes. We're not only getting the right quality material. We're also getting the right fit, the right tailor. So if I tell you it's a size 12, you are seeing exact size. So, so it's not, you know, just equip them because they already have the skills. You know, till tomorrow, that thing did not see the light of day. Yeah, sure. And I tell you what, I've been thinking about tailoring a lot recently. In fact, I was having a conversation with friends just last night about it. The two big issues, and we can use, we can use the fashion industry as a microcosm for entertainment, Every for industry. business, for energy, and all of that. So it's two big things. The first challenge that your friend 
has and probably ran into was how land regulation works in Nigeria. Mm. So one of the big things that we have to do, for example, in order to get people out of poverty, right, is to amend the Land Use Act. Yes. And this is something that's not very intuitive because many people don't know and understand it. But think about this. It is difficult to sell property in Nigeria. It's right. it difficult to acquire true. property in Nigeria because, not necessarily because the resources aren't there or the interest on both sides of the party aren't there, but the issue of governor's consent mm. is a big deal. A big the deal. issue of overriding public mm. interest. So, you may have had land that has been in your family yeah. for generations, and many people know it's an avenue of wealth because banks can lend to you yeah. on the basis of yeah. property, mm -hmm. right? You can use property to set up a company, right? Mm. You can start up something from your own home. Right, especially if you are not renting, because these days landlords in cities like Lagos and Abuja will tell you my property only residential, yeah. right, and all of those things. So land is a very important thing, but you can have property in your generation, and because the government decides they want to build something, they can legally requisition it. I'm just yeah. paying compensation, and you have no recourse. In it's literally written in the books, yeah. so it's a big, it's a it's a big deal, right, and. Countries like Japan and Taiwan basically gave farmers, they basically told farmers, people who have been serfs for generations, they basically said, the land you will have for free, but make sure productivity-wise, you meet so-so and so targets. Mm -hmm. If you meet this, you have access to more loans, mm -hmm. more land, mm -hmm. loans at much more favor mm -hmm. favorable interest rates. Mm -hmm. In some cases, um, I think particularly in Japan, right? Because they allow the local governments to then compete yeah. amongst themselves. So some prefectures in Japan would offer scholarships to the kids of farmers that did well, right? And those and the kids of those farmers were the people that ended up entering the factories of Toshiba and Toyota and Honda and all of these places and all of these products that we now consume. And that was how that cycle of development started, right? You know, and Taiwan did this, China is doing this now, Singapore did this. The point is, the template is clear. Mm -hmm. It's been done by many countries around the world. Nigeria's problems are not unique, right? There were parts of Western Europe that, in our grandfather's lifetime, they were killing and slaughtering themselves the way people got slaughtered, for example, today in Shagamu. Mm -hmm. They figured it out. We can figure it out. It's a matter of keeping our leaders honest and accountable. Mm -hmm. That's the big gap. So, mm -hmm. sorry, basically, uh, leaders are indifferent or... They have lack of poor prioritization, or is that it? The incentives don't make sense for them to deliver. So, so, let me, so let me tell you what, for example, China did, right? Um, China, for example, paired promotion within the Communist Party of China, which is the only political party in China, mm -hmm. to delivering in your home district. Mm. So if your home district or if your province was one of the economic stars, you were attracting business, people were in jobs, your unemployment rate was low, uh, was low your education enrollment rate and your attainment scores were high, economic growth was high, you were guaranteed a spot up the next ladder. Nigerian politics is not wired that way. Mm. Nigerian politics rewards you you know loyalty and longevity. Yes. Mm. Whether you worked or you did not work. As if long as you are loyal to your, 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 what's it called? Your godfathers, your, your good. Godfather. Precisely, right. Mm. Um, mm. Um, it, so it doesn't even encourage productivity as an, as an economy. Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. So if the, if the incentives align for politicians to get things done, they will do it. Mm. Where we see politicians move and do things is because the incentives are lying for them to do true, that. True. You would always have a constitutional amendment exercise every year because the incentives are such that there'll be a big budget, there'll be a big show, Just you can show to your constituents down. that yeah. I was the one who made this amendment mm. happen. And all. So the incentives work for them. Mm. They will do that. Elections, violence, the incentives are lying. So they are violent. Mm. So, so it's not like our politicians are unintelligent. And I speak to, I talk to a lot of them, which is why we are like, see, I've been mean. But, <laughs> but the thing is, the incentives don't work for them to do the things we want them to do. Mm. So that's the hard work that Nigeria has to do. And it's going to take a while. And it's going to adjust. Why I'm madly optimistic is that we cannot keep running Nigeria the way we're running it now indefinitely. It's, it's not possible. There's, mm. There are very few countries that have the countries that have done that are either too small or too insignificant, but like, why, there are a lot of Nigerians out here, mm. right? At some point, all of the people that are slaughtering themselves, when they've run out of people to slaughter and people to kidnap and all of that, will go and look for the people that have money. And if the political class is the only place where wealth is concentrated in, guess who will be the next target? Mm. Yeah. So do we want it to be through that approach or do we want to think smartly and coherently about how we want to fix this country and start? 
doing the hard things to get there. Those are our choices. Ah, that's wow. a tough question. I mean, like, now hearing you speak, it's not like these things are not, you're not far-fetched. Mm -hmm. Like us that we're farmers now, for instance, we have almost maybe 200 hectares of land now. We still, we still wait for governor consent. Because by now, if we had a proper documentation, see, of we would have got, gone to Bank of Industry, they would have given us loan, would have probably doubled all the mm -hmm. machines on the farm. You can enter you into foreign partnerships. Yes. Foreign, but no, you'd have even brought the foreign partners. You could have brought the foreign partners. Set up the industry here. We're already milling the palm. We just need a bigger milling plant, expand the land. But you see, these things, like, that's what I'm saying that. Is there, let me just wrap with this final question. Is there a willpower mm. with these politicians? Do they have the willpower to really alleviate poverty? Or they truly bank on poverty to continue to govern? Because look at what is happening across all the African countries, the came said. All the Gabons and all of that. Because whether we like it or not, if we get to that point, mm. they will not, this time there will not be any time to do any conversation. And I don't like violence. Mm. I believe that we can always solve the problem. But do you see that... There's even a willpower to even get these things done. Sorry. Let yeah. me add to sure. uh, willpower and the competence. Yeah. So you just made a hard question harder. Thank yeah, you. Yes. <laughs> and, the, and the competence. Thank you very much. Because I, I think that's very important. Yeah. And the, because sometimes it's important to also know that you cannot give what you don't have. Right. Yeah. Let's quickly so, answer. Actually, I can't think about it. The competence bit is actually harder. So, uh, as always, has, <laughs> given, was nice has given me my question. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think, so the competence, for the most part, is there. Mm. Because the thing about competence is, if you don't have it, you can hire it. Mm. Mm. Right. And a lot of these guys at the highest level are surrounded with people who it, or often have people. Competent people. Yeah, around. who okay. think. Mm. Right, who can yeah, who can be gotten at right? So 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 competence can be gotten at. The, the real question is the real power mm. because if the will power exists, even if the competence doesn't you exist in the country, it. you can find it. Can build it. You 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 will import competence. Not you, people they import go go see, uh, build but Khalifa. You exactly. Mm, right. You will you 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 go and find it. And we've been doing this for from time immemorial. When when the Japanese, for example, and I love doing this because the best book that I read this year was How Isha Works, mm -hmm. right? Which basically talked about how Japan, Taiwan, um, Japan, Taiwan, China, South Korea figured it out and developed, right? What Japan did was in the 1860s, after the opening up, after the US forced them to open up, they basically said, who are the best people are doing things? Who builds the best ships? Who has the best and educational system? Who has the best political system? And they went there and studied, and they imported them. So the Germans trained the Japanese army. The British trained the Japanese navy. Mm -hmm. They learned politics from the so Americans. They all the best so they basically it. crowdsourced. They it. So it's absolutely possible. The question is, willpower. willpower. Do the incentives align for them to do this? If we get to a point, for example, where Kingpins and militants in certain but parts of the country say. Don't finish it. 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 Um, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It is an act of justice. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human mm -hmm. beings. Sometimes it falls on a generation to be great. You can be that generation. Let your greatness blossom. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 8pm as we bring another great conversation to your screen.